We're live. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. We are here to talk about the huge impact that Seaspiracy is having around the world. It's trending on Netflix. It's hitting the top of the charts. We have some very special guests joining us to discuss the film, its impact, and the actions that we can take to save the oceans. My name is Amy Jean Davis. I'm the founder of LA Animal Save here in Los Angeles. I'm here with Anita Kreins, the co-founder of Animal Save Movement. And uh, uh, Anita, please go ahead and introduce the first panelist. Hi, it's with great pleasure that we introduce Kip Anderson. Um, his awakening as a filmmaker came as a result of An Inconvenient Truth. After seeing the film, he dramatically changed his lifestyle and believed he was doing everything he could to help the planet. But his life took a different direction when he found out that animal agriculture is the leading cause of environmental destruction. He directed Cowspiracy, The Sustainability Secret, and What the Health, and is producer of Seaspiracy. Uh, we have a short question for you, uh, Kip. Uh, first of all, um, Ali credited you with uh, choosing Ali as the protagonist in Seaspiracy, and that really helped make the film very relatable and authentic. Um, and our question for you is, what are some of the big impacts Seaspiracy has had that surprised you? Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you so much for having me. And just it was a co-director with Keegan Kuhn, awesome, another awesome filmmaker, part of the team. Um, and what did you say? What? Did, how did it impact? Uh, what are some of the big impacts Suspiracy has had that have surprised you? Well, it's it's gotten huge. I mean, it, it blew away even Netflix's predictions of how big it got. And um, I think just the amount of attention it got. I was very confident that it would. But it's just great to see, you know, you dream of this, but actually really hitting a main mainstream demographic and just have finally having the oceans and the fishes represented for the first time, not only in mainstream, the environmental movement and mainstream media and mainstream masses, but also in the, uh, uh, in the animal rights uh, movement as well. So it's great. It's just hitting on all these different points and different uh, demographics. Thanks. Uh, Amy, can you introduce Lamia, please? Yes, uh, this is Lamia Esamlali. She is co-founder and president of the French branch of Sea Shepherd and co-directs Sea Shepherd Global. She holds a Master of Environmental Sciences from the University Pierre at Marie Curie, uh, specializing in the conservation of biodiversity. Lamia has participated and organized more than 10 missions at sea on an international level. Antarctica for whaling, Galapagos Islands for the protection of the UNESCO listed marine park, the Faroe Islands, which is the greatest slaughter of marine mammals in Europe, the Mediterranean, protection of the bluefin tuna, West Africa, which is the largest illegal fishing uh, zone in the world, plundered by foreign fishing fleets. Lamia is also the author of a book uh, of conversations with Captain Paul Watson entitled interview with a pirate. So our question for you, Lamia, what is the biggest threat to the oceans and do you think that Seaspiracy covered it effectively? Well, obviously the biggest, the biggest threats uh, over the ocean survival is our uh, endless appetites for fish and also our lack of uh, empathy and lack of care for fish, which uh, allows us to kill billions of them without even thinking about it. And yeah, I, I do think Seaspiracy did an awesome job in trying to uh, put the spotlight on this issue that is very, very hard to, uh, to bring forward because we do talk a lot about uh, plastic and also climate change. But when it comes to what's in your plate, people don't want to hear about it. And that's also why um, um, the dolphin bycatch campaign that is also pictured in Seaspiracy is, is so important in my opinion uh, because dolphins help us attract attention to what is happening with the fisheries themselves because they have that capital of sympathy. People do care about dolphins. So that helps to protect fish um, even if people don't care about fish, not as much as they should. So... Yeah, I, I think uh, Seaspiracy is, um, is um, 
a mind-opening uh, documentary. In France, so far, it hasn't been as big as in uh, English-speaking countries because, well, French people um, are not that great with foreign languages, and so far it's only uh, French subtitles. So I, I do hope the French version of Seaspiracy is going to come out soon uh, because it's definitely going to help to... Uh, to promote the, the documentary. But those in France who have seen it uh, have been like shocked in a very good way. So definitely positive. Excellent, thank you. Uh, and do we have Peter with us or are we still waiting for Peter? Okay, I guess. Still waiting. Okay. Okay, um, I'll, I'll have, I have the pleasure of introducing Philip Wollen. Philip Wollen was vice president of Citibank and by the age of 40, he'd witnessed cruelty so egregious, he decided to do all he could to alleviate suffering and give away everything he owned and die broke. Today, he is a venture capitalist for good causes, supporting some 500 mission-oriented projects for children, animals, and the environment in more than 40 countries. Philip awards the annual Kindness Gold Medal to people who have devoted their lives in, in the service of others. He is, long, he is a long-standing significant supporter and volunteer with Sea Shepherd. His Kindness House project hosts more than 45 NGOs rent-free in Melbourne. Our question for Philip is, what was your takeaway from the movie based on what you witnessed firsthand when you were on the Bob Barker ship um, off the coast of Africa? Well, I saw most of the egregious suffering firsthand on the Bob uh, with Peter. Uh, but to frame the idea, I think we just need to look at the dynamics. Uh, in human history, only 100 billion human beings have ever lived. Seven and a half billion people are alive today. And we humans torture and kill two billion sentient, living, loving animals every week. And we stab and suffocate one billion ocean animals every eight hours. If human beings were killed at the same rate, we'd be wiped out in one weekend. And trillions of fish are now ground up into pellets to feed the livestock. Now, vegetarian cows are now the world's largest ocean predators. Now we all know that these oceans are dying in our time and they are the lungs and the arteries of the earth. They sequester more CO2 than all the forests of the world put together. And 10,000 entire species are wiped out every year because of the actions of one. So if this trend continues, no child under the age of five is ever going to reach retirement age. It's a mathematical impossibility. So now we face the sixth mass extinction in cosmological history. If any other organism did this, a biologist would call it a virus. It is a crime of unimaginable proportions. But to bring it back to the oceans, the human species had its lowly origins in the ocean. As uh, Richard Dawkins said, our uh, 185th millionth grandfather was a fish. Now, isn't it ironic that we humans, a gluttonous reptilian brand mammalian biped with an opposable thumb is poisoning the oceans, our birthplace and killing our cousins who still live there and ourselves in the process so when I was on the ships and uh, with Peter, I looked at the logbooks of the fishing ships and I realized they were not catch records. They were actually murder-suicide notes written by a stupid species. I realized that we're not special. We are statistically a rounding error. We're not fallen angels. We are risen apes. And we are writing the requiem for the planet. And that was the takeaway I, I took after being with Sea Shepherd for 15 years, seeing firsthand what happens out there on the water and on those coastal territories where poor people are starving because of the egregious cruelty and greed of richer nations. Well said. <laughs> Let's take a moment on, on all of that information. Um, thank you, Philip, for saying all of that. Um, 
we're in an, we're in a particular situation <laughs> and it's difficult to uh, understand why more people aren't concerned, especially people who have kids under five, you know, just for an example. Okay. So I'd, I'd like to say something about Seaspiracy, if I could. Uh, I said something before we started. Is that okay with you? I, uh, Absolutely. We just have a conversation. Um, I'm so grateful to Kip. You know, I've been a friend and admirer of his for, for, for so long. And uh, he's, he's a terrific fellow. Um, in 1962, um, Solzhenitsyn wrote a book called One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich. And this book made no impact at all. It simply settled gently into our consciousness. And in 20 years' time, a subtle thing happened. The book changed the way we saw Russia, and it changed the way the Russians saw themselves. In 1975, Another book had a similar effect, Animal Liberation by Peter Singer. And it had no effect at all at the time. But within 20 years, every initiative in the animal rights movement has Peter's fingerprints on it. So now I think I can actually say with confidence that seaspiracy will create a paradigm shift in the way in which we see and treat the oceans and all the individuals who live there. And I promise you, and I give you my word, a time will come when civilization will owe people behind Seaspiracy a debt of gratitude they could never repay. And I want to thank everyone involved in making this terrific film. Thank you. Beautifully said. And uh, Dr. Um, Ali said uh, in an interview with Plant Based News that basically it was a small crew. It was just uh, Ali, Lucy, and Kip sort of, you know, doing the filming and then editing and then bringing others on board. So it was a very small group of people that, are, that is behind a paradigm shift. So it's incredible. Um, Amy has a question regarding uh, um, the pub, how it's impacting the public. So Amy, do you want to ask? Okay, so Seaspiracy is trending on Netflix. It's top 10 in more than 57 countries. So my question is, why do you think it's capturing the attention of the public in such a major way? And this is for anyone. I think it's striking at the core of, you kind of, uh, you know, making these films over the year, Cowspiracy with the Health, it hits at a certain time in history. Like Cowspiracy felt like it hit at a perfect time as eight, seven years ago. And what the health, and you see game changers pop out, and then now it's the oceans, and there's some ethical films coming out too with the animal rights movement. I just feel we're a species that's kind of ascending of our consciousness is kind of coming full circle as us, uh, uh, you know, actualizing our dream of becoming human beings. And so I think it just hit at a perfect time, and people are just so shocked because it hits not only intellectually but also at the heart. Of like, wow, this is how amazing the ocean is, how it's intertwined to everything in the environmental, environmental movement. And then to see the fish that you just don't see on an everyday basis, uh, how, how you know shocking some of the images are, but then you learn about the fish sentience that's been largely ignored, a lot of, for a big reason, most people didn't know about it. So it hits on all these different heart chords, mind chords, logical, and at, a, at the perfect timing. So it's just all these things coming together, just it's just, you know, the perfect timing and just really grateful for that it, that it happened. And Kip, uh, what actually prompted you to get involved with this film or what uh, motivated you to be a part of the journey that is Seaspiracy? Well, if you look at Cowspiracy, we had a part on the oceans. It was only about five or six minutes. And each one of those sections in that film could be turned into a whole film. We wanted to make that one about ethics and about health and we realized, wow, bigger. After Cowspiracy came out, Ali, only 22 years old at the time, was exploring the same issues in the ocean. And Keegan, uh, I think Keegan actually found him, and, and exploring the same questions. Is there such thing as a sustainable fishing? Like, is there such thing as a sustainable land animal farming, you know, as they call it, land animal killing, really, for food? And he was working on this, and this was a long time ago, five years ago. He actually helped us with what the health and said, hey, let's turn this into a full film. Let's make this a global film and uncover and see if there is a possible way, any possible way to dig, dig, 
and dive deep if there's such thing as a, a way to sustainably fish at all. And so the journey started almost five years ago. It took a long time. But it's all, so one more example of, it was just a small team. It was them two doing all the filmings and me helping with the editing. You know, two or three people can do a lot. You know, the other films were just Keegan and I. So it's, it's, it's good motivation for anyone out there. A camera, a computer, you can do, you can do a lot and, and surround yourself with some talented people like them. Excellent. Thank you. Um, there are so many layers in this film. We did a poll on our Animal Safe Movement Twitter account asking what topic from the documentary had the biggest impact on people. Uh, corruption received the most votes with 35%. Herding sea animals came second uh, at 28%, followed by environment at 23%, and contaminated fish at 14%. Um, do these results surprise you? And how can we further engage the public so that the outcome is that more people switch to plant-based as is the first call to action on your, on the website. That's, that's really cool. You did that. That's really neat. Um, you know, the corruption and the films, you know, I think it's really about, it's just so shocking when you look at the environmental groups and it's the ocean and the green pieces, these are the ones that are supposed to be protecting the ocean that we look up to as kind of our environmental parents, that they're the ones giving us the information. And then to find out, you know, our environmental parents have been betraying us. It's, it's, you know, it's kind of a, it's a story of betrayal. It goes back forever, you know, in time of what, why that so hits so hard to people. Because these are the ones we look up to. And I, that's interesting that you did that, that, um, that poll. But um, um, I don't know what the other question I just was, I got caught up in that um, poll. But um, that's really, really telling though. And I think it's just one of those, it has to go back and once you have it revealed, what can you do about it as a viewer? Because you can't always trust the mass media and these people who you feel like you can trust. It's another reminder of that in the time, especially in the times we live in. Yeah, I guess my follow-up question was, um, uh, first of all, this poll was uh, to a general public. So we, we, paid for the, we, we, we paid for the poll to go out to a general audience, not our followers. Um, and... I guess the question is like, one of the big outcomes of this film is people are changing their uh, behavior. And your, your first call to action on the Seaspiracy website is for people to switch to plant-based to save the oceans. Um, and do you think these different reasons uh, will propel them to do that? I think you, I think it definitely these are the big reasons. Another one that's not on there, it'd be great to see if there was one about fish sentience. Because that was a topic we would have loved to go on 20 minutes into. It was only about you know, five or seven. And the book by John, Jonathan Balcom is interviewed in the film. It's called What a Fish Knows. And I feel towards the end of the film, that's what, because I asked those people, what was it? I'm not getting fish anymore. And I was asking them, what particular was it in the film? A lot of people said it was towards the end of the film when the whaler from the Faroe Islands, you know, you, you just inherently want to hate him because he's killing these whales. And then he's saying, hey, you can look at me. But if you're eating fish, if you're, if you're eating chicken, they all have their own life. And that's what a lot of people really uh, refer to that made them make the switch to not only eat fish, but all animals. Like, wow, yeah, if, I, if I'm mad at someone killing a whale, how can I eat a chicken or a salmon or some other animal? Because they all have an individual uh, life that want to live. And I, um, so I feel that's a big, a big thing. When, when you realize the sentience of fish, as Philip said, these are our cousins. They're our great, 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 great grand. We come from the ocean. Um, so I feel that's a big one as much as anything else. Thanks. Um, Lamia and Philip, um, in the film, uh, bycatch are the invisible victims of the fishing industry. What have you personally witnessed? Uh, Lamia, you say a recent discovery that Sea Shepherd has made is that 10,000 dolphins are being killed every year as bycatch on the French Atlantic coast. The French government has been hiding that for, the, for at least 30 years. How is the film changing public knowledge about bycatch and corruption in dolphin safe labeling, uh, quote unquote, verified by Earth Island Institute? Um, it, it, it's not a Sea Shepherd discovery. It's actually the French scientist who uh, rang the bell in 2017, saying that on average, 
3,500 dolphins were killed on the French coast. And at that point, I discovered the issue that has actually been going on for the past 30 years. But starting 2016, it went up and it went up uh, more and more every year until now. And I, I have been involved very much for over 10 years um, in the uh, the Green the Drop in the Fur Islands. I actually introduced uh, Jens Rasmussen, the, the wearer that we see in conspiracy to, to Ali, because when I was in the Fur Islands, I've had a lot of interesting discussions with, uh, with Jens. And as you say, uh, the first thing is you want to hate him because he killed whales, but at the same time, he did always respect us for not eating animals. And he's taught me a lot of things I needed to know at that time uh, when I was in the Four Islands to um, actually counter the, the Greens because we, at the time, uh, Sea Shepherd Friends had a, a fleet of small vessels that were deterring the dolphins, the pilot whales from, um, from the hunting bays. So I have a, a kind of uh, unique, interesting relationship uh, with, with Jens in that aspect because yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit uh, paradoxical. Um, but when I realized that in France, on the French coast, in my country, we were actually killing more dolphins than the Fur Islands and Taiji combined, I was shocked. I thought I had to do something in my backyard. And I, I realized that it, it was all happening because even if dolphins are a protected species on the paper, um, there is no measure to protect their habitat. There is no nothing to stop the non-selective fishing methods that are killing on average 300,000 uh, marine mammals every year. And what shocked me was that, because we, we, we started to, we thought, okay, this is happening. This has been going on for so many years. French people don't know about it. French people do love dolphins. French people eat fish without even thinking about the consequences. So how do we do it to make a, an electric shock, so to, to wake up people? And so we started to go on the fishing grounds and we started to film the bycatch because a lot of fishermen were actually denying they were responsible of the death of dolphins. They were saying that the dolphins that were washing on shore had been killed by storms or that they were um, sick dolphins. Um, and the scientists said, no, these dolphins, for uh, over 90% of them were healthy dolphins. They were young, they were like some pregnant females. And even when you don't see the scratch on their bodies, because most of the time you do see scratches because they try to get away from the nets that they are trapped in, they all have their lung literally e explode. I mean, it's, it's a, such a painful death. It, it, it takes a long time for them to die. And it, the French scientists call it the, the agony of the deep. So that gives you an idea of how much they suffer. And I thought it's such a long death, such a painful death, and it, thousands of them. The last numbers are um, effectively um, uh, over 10,000. And this is actually a threat to the species, to the dolphins population in the Bay of Biscay. And we started to take dead dolphins and we put them in the city centers uh, la the last thing we did was in front of the National Assembly in Paris because we knew that the Minister of the Sea was there that day and we had all the media there and, and we had a banner that said these dolphins are dying so that you can eat fish. Obviously, the, the Minister of the Sea was very mad at us. Uh, but what shocked me is that when we started doing these operations to wake up people, so many people told us, we don't have dolphins in France. I'm like, come on. I mean, we, ha we have the second largest marine territory in the world after the United States. France is the only country that has a presence in every ocean. And French people don't know that we have dolphins in France. I'm like, this is insane. How can you feel the, the, the loss of something that you don't even know is there? And I thought we have a big, big gap to cross. And when you ask the question, why do you think Seaspiracy is being such an electrifying movie? I think it's also because people are so far from even imagining what is happening in the ocean. And, and in that aspect, this film is, is really an eye opener because people know, 
like what's happening in slaughterhouses, you know, people feel more for uh, land mammals, but who, who really cares for what's happening in the sea? Who even imagine like 1% of what's happening in the sea? And this movie is putting it on the, ta on the table. So we are kind of, um, yeah, reaching out to the level that we should have, the level of knowledge that we should have. And I think that's why we are crossing such a big gap. So it, it, it has an impact. So many people, I, I don't know how it is in other countries, but in France, when you say that you don't eat animals, that you're vegetarian, well, they offer you tuna or salmon. I mean, hey, fish are not animals. How, look how we set the fishing quotas. We set the fishing quotas in tons. You, you don't ever dare to talk of tons of giraffes or tons of dogs, but tons of, of tunas or tons of, of sharks. That's okay, that's normal. So we are coming from very, very far. And, and that's the reason why I agree that it, it would have been great to, uh, to be able to expand a bit more on how fish sense things, how they are clever, because it, it's so hard to feel empathy for animals that are so different from us. And that's the reason why I think that's what we are doing here with dolphins is a primary issue, because if we don't manage to save dolphins in a country like France, I, I don't think we'll, we'll, we'll be able to save the ocean. It's, it's a too important thing. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, we will manage to uh, shake the statu quo. We, we are putting a lot of pressure on the French government. And I, I am hoping that seaspiracy is going to have the same impact in France as it's having in, in all other uh, English-speaking countries. Thank you. Um, Kip, in Suspiracy, the Plastic Pollution Coalition is a group that envisions a world free of plastic pollution. Uh, they are the same group as the Earth Island Institute, who was mislabeling tuna as dolphin safe. Does this explain why they are ignoring plastics from fishing nets? They are not just part of the problem. They, are, they, they have youth ambassadors on their website. How are we going to get them to take plastic pollution from fishing nets seriously? when they are deeply connected to the fishing industry? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I think part of it too is, even though, you know, the film's called Sea Spirits and there's definitely an element of conspiracy where they're inspiring to hide the truth, but a lot of it is ignorance. A lot of it is ignorance, especially in the ocean is out of sight, out of mind. And that goes with the, uh, you know, the, the, the plastic NGOs. A lot of them do good work, you know, the uh, Plastic Coalition, they do a lot of good work, a lot, especially a lot of the plastic is cleanup is right on beaches. But so that's a big, big goal of conspiracy is to open them up like, hey, whether you know about this or not, let's not focus on whether it's a cover up or not. This is the truth. Let's focus on this. So I feel this is definitely a kick in the, a kick in the tail that, that um, they will do this. I mean, cross fingers, you know, Calspiracy, we've thought Greenpeace, Sierra Club, and Amazon Watch, they would do that right away. And it's taken a while, for at least the U.S. organizations. But we just feel with a lot of pressure from anyone who's watching this, an activist, you know, a big, big way to be an activist is online. You know, give pressure online. We're, you know, you can be a very powerful activist in front of your computer. So that's a huge thing. Just keep on giving pressure relentless and, and consistent. And it will happen. They have to. Uh, there's going to be another plastic NGO that's going to overtake them that does talk about it, that's more aligned with that everyone agrees with and you can feel the truth. So it's either that they have to do it, or if not, they're going to be left behind in the past with the rest of the failed um, NGOs that didn't keep up with the times. Thank you. Uh, Philip, with your kindness house, you bring together lots of environmental and animal NGOs and activists. How do we get the environmental NGOs to recognize the devastating impact on fishing, uh, of fishing on plastic pollution and make that a pr this a priority in the work that they do? How do we get environmentalists to promote plant-based diets and food system change? Well, Anita, you've asked a very important question. Um, most environmentalists are more concerned about, uh, you know, the forest and uh, you very rarely get them uh, to uh, to see the, the abject cruelty inflicted uh, on animals and the need for having the animal kingdom as part of our debate. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Agatha said that mankind is motivated not by reason, but by ritual. Uh, that's why one of the clauses in our, in our so-called lease agreement at Kleinus House was we had two, two important clauses. 
One, if you eat animals in my building, I kick you out. And two, if you have a dog and you don't bring him to the office, we kick you out. <laughs> um, now, one of the things that um, uh, I, I would have liked you to have had in your survey is asking the question, what about the morality of killing animals or killing, killing ocean animals? And I don't think Sea Spiracy is a film that you should watch once. You should watch it several times because you'll get another message every time you do so. The, the issues I see coming out of a film like this and out of our, our broader study of the subject, and, it, and they're these, it's, it's plastic, it's poaching, it's poverty, profit, and politics. And, and these cancers metastasize into corruption, exploitation, money laundering, capital flight, economic collapse, refugees, and violence. Uh, Admiral uh, Denny Begin, uh, an American, um, the chief of US war fighting requirements said, we have learned that nations will raid and invade long before they starve. So it doesn't really matter at all whether it's fish, rana horn, elephant ivory, exotic reptiles, birds, or animals. The same crooks are cogs in the same grinding wheel. But in the ocean, the crimes are ubiquitous because out of sight is out of mind. From cetaceans, dolphins and whales, to krill and salmon factories, down to the tasteless, tacky, itchy fish tanks we see in private homes. They are just as vile and squalid. And all of them, with no exception, are defended by cheaply bought politicians, profiteers, ignoble minds, and of course, gullible, gluttonous consumers. So it's everybody's fault. A few years ago, I, I funded and produced a film called The Plastic Cow in India, showing the treatment of cows that are left to graze in rubbish bins in the street after working all day. And we found on an average of between 30 and 60 kilograms of plastic wire and syringes in their stomachs. We've had to buy a hundred of these cows and operate on them to find out this information. And we found vast amounts of plastic in, in the, after doing an autopsy on juvenile elephants in the jungle. Plastic in the jungle. But the biggest impact happened with the cows. And we took a, this case to the Supreme Court in New Delhi. And um, uh, the judges said something interesting. Plastic poses a greater threat to India than thermonuclear war. Now that was a very telling statement. But India today, despite it being a predominantly Hindu and Jain country with over a billion people who love and revere the cow, the cows continue to be treated abysmally. I wrote a paper on it where I called the brutalized cow. I said she has become this docile, peaceful, loving animal has now become a scavenging god, turned out in the street to fend for herself before she's abused the next day. And this is in a country where animal rights and the term ahimsa 3,000 years ago from the Upanishads, non-violence to any living being, is enshrined in their national constitution. And India today still owns the world's largest dairy herd and is the largest exporter or the second largest exporter of li live animals. So it's, we face a really difficult challenge. We need films like Sp Sea Spiracy and activist groups like Sea Shepherd and many others to tackle this, this vile, hideous, grotesque paradigm that we have at the moment head on and take no prisoners. I'm sorry to speak so forcefully about it, but the time for being passive and benign is long past. Thank you, Philip. Thank you for always illuminating these, these major problems so eloquently uh, and urgently. If I can, can shift the conversation to a, a, a spotlight on humans for this last question for this part. Um, in The Guardian, Oceana uh, are saying that they're misrepresented in the film. They said, quote, choosing to abstain from consuming seafood 
is not a realistic choice for the hundreds of millions of people around the world who depend on coastal fisheries, many of whom are also facing, facing poverty, hunger, and malnutrition. So my question is, do you think that this is in fact the film's argument? Or was the film targeting poor fishing communities or is it targeting Netflix's audience who can actually make the choice to give up eating fish? Exactly. It's, it's another poor attempt. When the film came out, we were prepared for a PR attack. They, a week before the film came out, they officially even announced we were going to attack the facts in the film and doing this big PR campaign before the film even came out. We were prepared for a big backlash. And it was pretty mild because it shows how strong the facts are. And then you see something like this come out. And it's um, what's interesting about Oceana is Oceana – the exact same interview was in Cowspiracy eight years ago. And it's something about, you know, how be the best way to protect fish is to eat fish. And we even said it in the same way, uh, pur purposely. Um, and so the thing is they come up with that, oh, this, what about all the hundreds of millions of people? Some say up to a billion people, which is highly, uh, very high, but say it even is a billion people. In the film, we go to Somalia and actually defend the local fishermen. This, this actually defend them by saying anyone, yeah, anyone who was watching this film, stop eating fish. And, and we're not, we're not damning anyone who's local fishermen that's indigenous or it's completely essential to their culture. In fact, we protect it. So it's what you said. I always say is if anyone who's watching this right now, if you have social media, if you have Instagram, if you have Facebook, if you have Netflix, if you have YouTube, this film is for you. If you don't, and if it's some indigenous tribe, uh, that relies on fishing, then it's not for them. So that's it's just a poor attempt to try to discredit the film. It's about the seven seven point four billion people that you can make a choice. Thanks. Thank you. Bob. Yes, Anita, you you asked a question about environmentalists generally speaking. If I could briefly just say this. Um, I've been a donor and an activist and volunteer for over 30 odd years, longer than any of you have been alive, I think. And we support some 500 projects in over 40 countries. And, and like Kip, Kip, I read all the objections to your film and all their complaints. I have to tell you, if that was their artillery, they just fired a blank. It exactly. was utter garbage, juvenile, adolescent, undergraduate nonsense. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm just full of admiration for you guys for doing this, and I'm very grateful um, and to you and everyone at Sea Shepherd. Believe me, there is no group, and I happen to know something about this because I've been in it a long time. There is no group like Sea Shepherd. There are indeed many fine organizations who say a disaster is looming, support us, and we will warn the world about it. But at Sea Shepherd, we say a disaster is looming, support us, and we will stop it. Now, that is the difference. I, I don't just want activists to come out of the woodwork and repeat the same old mantras we've heard all the, in the past. What I'm really hoping for is to kind of find a new breed of activists, if you like, a proactivist, someone who's willing to get onto the front and confront not just the industry, but the people who grease the wheels, the banks, the insurance companies, the governments, the lobby groups, to take them on, because that's where the real battles are going to be fought. Thank you. Um, the first call to action on Seaspiracy's website is to shift a plant-based diet to save the oceans. Um, the interviews with Jackie and Diana from the Plastic uh, Pollution Coalition were so awkward and cringeworthy. Um, Jackie admits fishing is a problem and that we should consider eliminating fishing. And then Ali asks her boss, Diana, why they haven't put this important message on their website. But she comes very insistent that Jackie didn't say eliminate fish. When, when Ali says she did, Diana says, I, do, I know she didn't. It was almost like a schoolyard spat. And um, one of the people that have really influenced the animal safe movement is Leo Tolstoy um, and Gandhi. And both of them said that, uh, to, quote, to quote Tolstoy, he said, the only true way of, for a person to improve human life 
is by way of moral perfection in their personal life. Um, and basically that is the first step uh, that one needs to take is look at is self-improvement. And, and Tolstoy himself wrote an essay called The First Step where he went to visit a slaughterhouse and bear witness. And then he said, the first step to being a good person is to be an ethical vegetarian. He would say vegan today. Um, so the question is, do you think environmental leaders need to go plant-based and vegan themselves so that they can tackle the truth? And that is, uh, you know, plastics from fishing nets and uh, trawlers and all the other um, destruction that's taking place in the oceans. Well, Phil, if you want to answer that, but I'll just say, yes, it says, as uh, Howard Lyman says in Cowspiracies, like, it's impossible to be an environmentalist and eat meat, just straight up. You can call yourself what you want, but the information, and especially even seven years after that film came out, the more data, it's just endless and endless. And now with the ocean, it just doesn't connect. I mean, if you're really looking into connecting the dots, now everything ties back, it funnels just, you know, and it's just so clear now it's it's not that's the thing too is i think uh, you know well we don't agree with this where a lot of people say oh being vegan is the final step into my activism or whether i'm in i someday i'll get to that point where right now i'm working on this issue this issue it's not that it's you know, something to eventually get to it's the first step and then get to these other ones that's why in yoga the eight limbs the first one is ahimsa the very first one of the yamas it's not you know, to, of the first eight limbs, of the first of the eight limbs is, is ahimsa. You start there. You start the board game of life there. Then you go to step two. It's not like you go there, number five, step five. It begins here. And then you work on all these other things. People think, oh, you think you're vegan and ever since all the world? No. This is just the first step, the first step of compassion is as much as possible. Then move, then move on to the next one. I'm sure Philip has a beautiful answer for that as well. Yeah, and just, just before Philip goes, I just wanted to reiterate the, the idea, like, should we make an effort to convert the leaders of these environmental organizations to go plant-based? Absolutely. Like, I mean, ethical diet, they will be more likely to tackle the issue. So should, should we actually have tactics that are geared, like even letter writing campaign or petitions, and calling for the leaders of environmental organizations and their board of directors to go vegan? Yes. I mean, a long time ago when, you know, organizing how to make these films, it was always, I remember like really meditating on we're getting in the animal rights movement and just working on looking environmental is that, you know, a lot of people do grassroots. And then like, I was thinking, what about gold roots top down and to affect the, the, the leaders because they're so influential, whether it's, you know, political politicians or uh, entertainment leaders. And so that was a big reason why we go to these groups. When we go to the groups, we say, can we interview your CEO? Because when you tap them and there's some awkward interview, we do our best. If you see when we ask the questions, it's really with compassion. We do as nicely as possible. The, the, the question and the way the answer reveals itself, oh, you make them look so bad. If they say that, it's just the answer. And so it's really questioning them and somehow publicly, if you can, in a compassionate way, getting these type of conversations that Al Gore has gotten in a lot. You know, when he came out in Community and Truth, you know, eventually he went vegan. He still doesn't talk about it too much, but I think that's a big one is having conversation with these leaders because it's absolutely true. So putting pressure on, again, pressure on whether it's through social media, on their, on, you know, whether it's a famous person or, or environmental leader, just consistently do it. That puts a lot of pressure on them to finally have to align with their ethics and their movement to becoming one, and that's including not eating animals. I think that's very well put. If, um, going vegan or getting onto a plant-based diet, we call them a BGO, a blinding glimpse of the obvious. I'm, I'm surprised we've even got to have, to have the conversation. Uh, you know, recently I discovered I never actually became vegan. I just woke up one day and realized that's what I was. Fortunately, I didn't ever meet any of the nasty vegan Nazis who wanted to see uh, everything that I did to make sure it was vegan enough for their standards. But I realized my shoes didn't have animal products or my belt or my watch band or my diet. Just, I just discovered one day that I was vegan. Now, um, nowadays, I spend a lot of my time, uh, COVID permitting, speaking in boardrooms to, to corporate executives from 
rather large companies across a variety of industries. And one of the questions I ask is this, what if I could show you a way that your company or you or your family would never be exposed on the front page of the newspaper as being cruel, unethical, or lacking any moral fiber? What would you say if you had your name on the building? How would you behave? How would you, what are the decisions you make? How would they be affected if you brought your son or your daughter in to work alongside you every day? Now let's assume, for example, I, I could give you this, this um, panacea, this magical solution of being an ethical organization. What effect do you think it would have on your company, on your, on your share price? Would it go up or down? What effect would it have on your weighted average cost of capital? Would it help you attract more qualified people to your organization or less qualified? Would it improve your sales, your profits, your margins, or make them worse? Now, any CEO who gets the answer wrong ought to be fired. So if a company decided they wanted to be to present the image of being an ethical, fully integrated, well-managed, well-led enterprise, they must have a vegan agenda. I gave a speech to 2,000 very wealthy Indian entrepreneurs in New Delhi, and in the front row was Amartya Sen, who had just won India's Nobel in economics. And after it was over, many of the executives in that room came up to me and said, we're going to turn all our factory canteens vegetarian. Not vegan, because veganism in India is a, is a difficult gig. But they accounted for over a million employees. So there is a great deal of power in the leverage of talking to the right people in the right way about subjects that affect them and their businesses. And I think what I'm doing nowadays may help in some small way in that direction. Thank you, Philip. Um, Anita, in the interest of time, uh, is it okay if we just uh, ask one final question to the panelists and then, um, and then ask them for their final closing thoughts? Okay, so I think uh, a really important question, I would love to hear from each panelist on this. What can Animal Save Movement and all of our uh, worldwide organizers and, and uh, participants, or just anyone, uh, what can we do to promote the film most effectively? I think, well, one, thank you for promoting it, one especially I think who's watching this is thank you so much for promoting the film and sharing it and talking about it. So it's just really that. And also just a, once again, I guess the armchair being the armchair activist where you can do a lot by sharing the film and, 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 you know, signing petitions and really doing a lot of effort on, you know, other groups, leaders in the environmental movement or leaders in just period, and just really putting the pressure on of this needs to be discussed and continuing the conversation continuing the conversation and opening it up for them. Thank you, Kip. Okay, I, I don't know much about promoting anything. As you can tell, I'm completely unqualified to talk intelligently about these subjects or any other for that matter. But I've, in the past, I know we've all won battles in, in this particular space against greyhound racing, horse racing, whaling, hunting, live animal exports, even slavery. We've won those battles, but ultimately they've come back. And at Sea Shepherd, we never ever take anything for granted. Now, I'm sure most of you would have read or have heard about Bethel Brecht's great parable play, uh, The Resistible Rise of Arturo Yui. He wrote it in 1941, whilst Hitler was still alive. And it's a thinly veiled reference to Hitler in the middle of World War II. And this is long before the US even entered the war. Well, the play ends and the curtain comes down. The tyrant is dead and Arturo Yui comes out in front of the curtain and takes off his mustache. And he speaks directly to the audience. And he says, do not rejoice in his defeat, ye men. For though the world rose up and defeated the bastard, the bitch that bore him is in heat again. What I am saying is, 
we have got to be conscious of the fact that these people will come back even after we've beaten them. And the lesson, therefore, is eternal vigilance is the price we pay for liberty. We must be vigilant, keep the pressure on them, continue making these films, because without them, we are well and truly lost. And that prognosis is totally unacceptable to the civilized mind. Thank you, Philip. I couldn't agree more with you about uh, continuing to be vigilant, and especially in the area of making films. Uh, my partner, Sean Monson, is a filmmaker, and uh, I just, anytime he is able to uh, get the support he needs to create a film and get it out there, I just, I, I know how impactful films are, and it always makes me so happy when that's something that he can do, and all the other filmmakers uh, in the movement. It's just always such a joy. Uh, so Lamia, uh, what, in your opinion, what can people do to promote Seaspiracy? Well, it's, it's the same. I, I don't really know, except uh, by saying that it's a great movie. But I, I mean, when, when people do ask me, uh, how can we help Sea Shepherd, which is uh, can, towards the same goal, I, I always say that, even before saying make a donation, because we do rely on donation, I say, if you want to help Sea Shepherd, if you want to help us in our mission, stop eating fish. The fish that's on your plates has a, a greater uh, role in the ocean. And, and just to complete about what was uh, being said about uh, the fact of going vegan and stop eating animals, I think it's a tricky one because it's, um, at least in, in, in France, people are, feel very, very close to uh, the French gastronomy and what's in your plates is, um, is filled as something that's very, very personal. And, and it, as soon as you start talking about what's in your plate and you, you sound intrusive, and I've been in the position for many years of the one who always loved animals and who always cared about the environment and who was eating animals. I mean, when I joined Sea Shepherd 16 years ago, I was eating fish and meat. And I actually stopped eating fish before I stopped eating uh, meats, which is like, uh, I guess, quite rare. Usually it's the other way around or it's like everything on, on the same thing. But anyway, I think, I think the main message is we, it's easy to be a sort of a hero in this, in this battle because the only thing you have to do is to give the ocean a break, is just to think if that fish that's in my plate is not mandatory to my survival, then the best thing I can do for the ocean is to leave it in the ocean, to leave it to those who actually need it for their survival. And that means some of the human beings, a minority of us, who eat fish and need it for their survival. There is enough fish in the ocean for these people. The problem is the majority of people who don't need it and who eat it like they would be eating carrots without any thought. And also for uh, marine predators who cannot have alternatives. So really, I don't know. It's um, This movie is about um, what is the greatest threat right now on our own survival and also, I think there is um, an image, uh, a thought that we are doing okay because we are over 7 billion and we, we go in the space and we have uh, such a great technology. But what I tell people uh, when we do conferences is there are three signs of an extinction of a species. And this is overpopulation, overconsumption of the resources, and, the expand, and uh, to be expanded in all the environments. So basically, if you want to see uh, species facing extinction, you just have to look at yourself in the mirror. So if you have children or if you care for other people's children, I, I just don't even understand how you cannot be an environmentalist. And being an environmentalist that's consistent is obviously to stop eating, uh, eating animals. But it's, it's something that's uh, a bit hard to push on people, for sure. So I don't know. I know that here, at least in France, pressure doesn't work. I mean, and it, it's counterproductive. So it, it's more how you convince people that, first of all, it's, it's not a luxury thing. It's mandatory. And second of all, there are alternatives that are good for your health. And you're not being punished if you stop eating animals because there is that thought that, yeah, 
that veganism is uh, such a sad, sad diet. And I think at least in France, if we want to push it forward, we need to develop um, the alternatives, the vegan alternatives, much, much more than what it is. I, I've been amazed for many years when I was traveling, going to Germany or to UK or to the United States, all the choices, the vegan choices that we had. I mean, it, it was like paradise for vegans. And in France, we, we are, I think, 15 years back. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's definitely the biggest, the biggest challenge of all because this is something that we cannot go around. And at the same time, it's something that, uh, yeah, people are ready to, to stop, to quit uh, using a one-time single uh, plastic use, but to change what's on their plates is, is much, much more difficult. So I think it's a mix of pressure in a good way knowledge, logical, like feel good with yourself. Um, I don't think anyone is happy with, with himself feeling that he's contributing to destroying the world. So obviously there must be an inside struggle. So you do feel better when you ally your uh, uh, behavior with your thoughts. And uh, at the same time, showing that, hey, you know, life is not sad when you don't when you quit eating animals, uh, you, will, uh, you will feel pleasure eating and you will be healthy and it's going to be better for the planet and for our children. So, yeah. Thank you, Lamia. Anita, did you have any final questions or thoughts? Uh, just, just one question about uh, omega-3. A lot of people talk about omega-3 because it's so important for uh, the healthy functioning of the heart, brain, and nervous system. Uh, how can we get these essential fatty acids from a plant-based diet? Well, let's do that, answer that quickly. They actually found out there's a, the, for the first plant-based B12, it's called in lentin. They just found out it's basically almost like a, a water lentil. It's almost like an algae. And there's some supplements that are out there. And so one of them is I'm actually part of called Glow, G-L-O, Vegan. Um, B12 supplements is a very simple one. I actually, you know, I've been vegan 13 years. I've taken B12 supplements two or three times in my life, one bottle. Um, but it's very easy to do a pill, you know, like super simple. <laughs> and spirulina, DHA, vegetarian fish oil, chia seeds. Right. And that's without the mercury and all the yeah, exactly. plastic and all the crap that's in the ocean. Okay. Right. I, you know, the, the omega-3 fatty acids that the fish are producing are coming from their diet, which is uh, algae for a lot of them. <laughs> so we can just skip the, the, you know, the fish and go straight to the algae. There's plenty of uh, supplements available. And, you know, pre-vegans are no strangers to supplements. Just walk into any health food store and there are miles of supplement shelves full of supplements <laughs> targeted at them as well. So we can easily get that. Yeah, and you, you can also get it from, uh, as, as, as Kip mentioned, you can get it from chia seeds, ground flaxseed, flaxseed oil, canola oil, walnut, soybeans, and leafy, green leafy vegetables all have the essential acid. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for being with us today. If you have any final thoughts, we would just love to hear, hear from them. We appreciate your time. We appreciate the incredibly vital work that you are doing for the future of the planet. Uh, thank you again for being here. So, um, uh, Kip, any final thoughts? Uh, we'll just thank you all so much. I'm a huge fan of Animal Saves. Thank you so much for what you're all doing. We're all doing it together. I just thought of a term uh, inspired by Philip who just came up with this one, you know, about vigilance. Um, a new term, compassionate, compassionate vigilance, a new made-up term for us to uh, to uh, work on. And just you know, just anyone out there listening, just you know, it's been a long road, as Philip kind of mentioned. And, and you know, I guess before it was a fight of just the compassionate, the war and compassion. But it's just so it can be disheartening sometimes when you see some of these films and what's going on on the planet. But just to remember. The time has come that we're finally on, on the side of momentum. It, you know, it took a long time. I've been vegan in this movement for 13 years. And up until the past, I mean, most people would say not until about five, six years ago, finally, it's like we're not the weirdos. We're not the, 
ones that people laugh at. You know, every movement has its, was it first you get ignored, then you get laughed at, then you get, you know, your argument. We're at the part where it's fighting and acknowledged, and that's a good sign. It's a huge good sign. So we're getting there. We are, you know, if the tipping point isn't about to happen, it already happened. So really, too, as the fight continues, to enjoy and realize we'll be looking back this moment that we were part of this shift that's happening at such an incredibly exponential fast rate. And we're at the forefront, and we're all doing it together. So I just want to thank you, everyone of all you and everyone who's listening to helping out, making it happen. Thank you, Kip. Lam, yeah, I'd love to hear your, your final thoughts. Um, I must say that it, it's true that sometimes uh, you you wake up and you see the situation and uh, you can feel like um, um, doomed and depressed because uh, things are not necessarily getting uh, fast enough. Um, but I do think that the best way to uh, fight uh, depression is to feel active and to feel part of something. Um, I, it, and disconnect yourself from the results, actually, in the end. I mean, it, it doesn't, of course, it, you hope that you will have, um, that we'll have a, the positive outcome and that humankind is going to wake up on time. But if, if we don't, then at least you can go back on your life and say that you have done everything you could. And to me, that that's really my, my motor. That's what's makes me go forward independently of what is happening um, and this way I don't need to be especially pessimistic or optimistic I mean it's all about what you know that you, what you have to do um, to do your part to try to make this world a better place so that's extremely motivating and nothing nothing and no one can take that from you no matter what is happening all around so I, I would encourage everyone to just find the best way for them to participate in what's the most important thing in everything on life is actually to save life. Because so far, the heritage of humankind is not, is not the great things that we think that we're doing. You know, it's not the cathedrals, it's not our technology, it's not our poems, our stories. What we are going to leave behind us is the massive extinction of life. And that's what's is going to stay millions of years after us. So let's try to change that fate. Um, I think that's the best thing we can do. And we are a particular generation because we are the last generation that can do something about it. So keep that in mind. Thank you for highlighting the, the power that every individual person actually has. And Philip, final thoughts? Judge White's closing words in the bonfire of the vanities were these. The law is humanity's first attempt at decency. So I ask everybody who's watching this today to join us in a battle, in a war that decency cannot afford to lose. Because in the end, only three things matter. How deeply you love how gently you lived, and how gracefully you let go of things that were not meant for you. Killing and eating animals was not meant for you. That. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I wanted to draw everyone's attention to the petition on change.org, uh, which is calling on the UK government to uh, create and enforce no-catch marine reserves in at least 30% of UK waters and over half a million people have signed already. Uh, and so if you go to the Seaspiracy website, the first call to action is to switch to plant-based, uh, but there's also this petition calling for the creation of uh, um, these, these uh, no-catch marine reserves. Um, and uh, we, uh, there's also gonna be a number of banner drops uh, encouraging people to watch Seaspiracy. Uh, Angus in Bristol, UK, has uh, organized 150 banners to be uh, sent to various locations in Britain and worldwide. Um, at the Animal Seed Movement, we're printing 50 banners, watch these spears that are smaller. His are 10 meters across, so they're for bridges. 
Ours are uh, smaller, six feet, six feet for like safe squares and vegan outreach. And we're also printing more than 10,000 stickers saying watch conspiracy. So there's a lot of things you can do. Uh, I think it's really important to share on social media and get all your friends and family to watch conspiracy. Um, and because every single person that watches it is a win for, for, for the planet. Um, well, thank you again, everybody. Go ahead, Anita. Oh, yes, go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Thank you again for being here. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. Uh, and we just really appreciate your time. And thank you for your part in the film Seaspiracy. We hope that it continues to be uh, the major impactful um, paradigm shift that it looks like it's, it's, it's going to be. Thank you so much for having us on and for doing all your work, everyone. Huge fans of all you. Take care. All Thanks. right. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everyone.